In today's lesson, we will be learning about the relative clause. We will learn that this clause begins with a relative pronoun, like who, that, or which. But before we talk about this, we are going to review a few of the words that I have been using in our previous lessons. We have learned that a group of words can be called a phrase or a clause. Both of these is a group of words. The difference is that a phrase does not have a subject and a verb in it. I can say, for example, I jump into the pool. Where do I jump? Into the pool. Into the pool is a phrase. It is a group of words. It tells me where I jump, but it does not have a subject and a verb. Into the pool is not a sentence. It is just a phrase. A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a verb. I jump into the pool is a group of words. It has a subject, I, and a verb, jump. I jump into the pool is a clause. It is also a sentence. It is a complete thought. So I jump into the pool is a kind of clause called an independent clause. An independent clause can be a sentence all by itself. Independent means it doesn't need anything else. It can be all by itself. So I jump into the pool is an independent clause. I can combine independent clauses. I can take two independent clauses and combine them into one long sentence. If I do that, I need to use a conjunction. This is a fancy word that sometimes I call it the glue that we use to glue two things together. We could take one independent clause and add some glue and another independent clause, and then we would end up with what we call a compound sentence. For example, I jump into the pool. I jump into the pool, comma, and I am happy. Or I want to jump into the pool, comma, but it is raining. The kind of conjunction that we use when we want to combine this independent clause with this independent clause would be something like and, but, so, or. When we use this kind of conjunction called a coordinating conjunction, we are combining two independent clauses. The first one has a subject and a verb, and it can be a sentence all by itself. And then we put a comma, we turn the period at the end into a comma, add the coordinating conjunction, and then comes the other independent clause that we want to add. And then our period goes at the very end of this. And all together, that becomes called a compound sentence. Okay, so again, I want to jump into the pool. It is raining. Those are two sentences. I can combine them with the word, but. I want to jump into the pool, but it is raining. There's another kind of conjunction that we can use that is called a subordinate conjunction. Subordinate conjunction. Examples of this are words you might have seen before. Words like because, unless, while, if, when, even though, since. When we use a conjunction like this, we're going to attach it to the beginning of an independent clause. So we take a sentence like, it is hot. Okay, here's a sentence, it is hot. If I take a word like this and put it to the beginning, because, because it is hot, this cannot be an independent sentence anymore. 
If I add the word because, because it is hot does not give me a complete thought. It cannot be a sentence all by itself. So if I add the word because to the front of it is hot, I no longer call it an independent clause. I call it a dependent clause. So because it is hot is now a dependent clause. That means it depends on being connected to, dun, 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 dun. oh, I have it right here, my independent clause. So I need to have these two connected. And if I do that, if I connect a dependent clause and an independent clause, I don't call it a compound sentence, I call it a complex sentence. So a compound sentence is when we have two independent clauses connected with this kind of glue. This is my orange glue. I jump in, or I want to jump into the pool, but it is raining. If I use this kind, then I could say, I could start with an independent clause. I jump into the pool. I could have another one. It is hot. And I think, oh, I can combine those. So I jump into the pool because it is hot. So together, my subordinate conjunction and my, and my it is hot, which has a subject and a verb. Together, this is now called a dependent clause and it needs to be connected to an independent one. I jump into the pool because it is hot and that is called a complex sentence. Well, there's another kind of complex sentence that uses a different kind of dependent clause. So a complex sentence combines independent and dependent. There's another kind of dependent clause that we're gonna talk about today, that instead of using this kind of conjunction, it's going to use the relative pronoun. And that's what I showed you at the beginning of our lesson. So we can use a relative pronoun like who, that, and which to make a special kind of dependent clause called a relative clause. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to share with you my iPad screen. Let's take a closer look at the relative clause. We know that a relative clause, being a clause, is a group of words that has a subject and a verb. A relative clause will begin with a relative pronoun. A relative pronoun are these three words here. We use who if the pronoun is referring to a person. We use which if the pronoun is referring to a thing or an animal. And we can use that in some cases to refer to either a person or a thing. A relative clause is going to follow a noun. Remember that a noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. And a noun can be a subject in the sentence or an object of the sentence. When we have a noun in the sentence, we might want more information about it. We might want to know specifically, which one are we talking about? The relative clause is one way to answer the question, which one, or to give us some extra information about the noun. Sometimes that information is really important and without it, we don't know which one we're talking about. And sometimes it's just extra information. So we will be looking more at the relative clause in this lesson. Let's take a look at this sentence. The students need to see Mr. Brown during recess. So the subject of this sentence, and I use red for the subject, is the students. 
the students do what? Let's look for the verb. I use green for the verb. The students need. The students need what? They need to see Mr. Brown during recess. Well, if you heard your teacher say this in class, you might ask the question, all of the students? Which students? I want more information. Does every student need to see Mr. Brown during recess today? So your question is a very good question. And it's the question, which ones? Which students need to see Mr. Brown during recess? Well, let's try doing the sentence a different way. The students who play violin need to see Mr. Brown during recess. Does this sentence and this sentence have the same meaning? No, they don't because in this sentence, the students need to see Mr. Brown during recess we're not really sure which students. The sentence does not tell us. We do know that we have a group of words here that has a subject and a verb. This is a sentence all by itself. This is, in fact, the independent clause. Here, we can still see that. In fact, I'm going to show you these side by side. Both of these sentences say, the students need to see Mr. Brown during recess. And that is the independent clause. This is the subject and this is the verb. The students need, the students need. Both of these sentences have the same independent clause, but this one has these three extra words, who play violin. And these are important words because they are telling us which students. So a relative clause we will find today is a group of words that has both a subject and a verb, so it's a clause, and together it's going to give us more information about the noun that it is following. And it will answer the question, which one or which ones. When something answers the question, which one, it is acting like an adjective, giving us more information about a noun. And students are people. People are nouns. A person, place, or thing is a noun. So a relative clause is going to be when we have a group of words that has a subject and a verb, it will come after a noun, and it will give us more information about this noun. Specifically, it will tell us which ones are we talking about. So there are different kinds of relative clauses, and there are some different rules about those different kinds, and that is what we will be learning about today. So let's begin by looking at this sentence. My friend loves the new swimming pool. So when we look at this sentence, we see a group of words. It has a subject. Okay, the sentence is about my friend. My friend what? My friend loves. So loves is the verb. My friend loves, subject, verb. This is a group of words with a subject and a verb that can be a sentence all by itself. So this is an independent clause. My friend loves the new swimming pool. I want to remind you that because my friend is just one person, we have an S at the end of the verb loves. My friend loves. If, my, if this was more than one friend, for example, if it was my friends, then you would need to get rid of the S at the end of the word love. So if we have an S at the end of my friends, more than one friend, then we would not have an S at the end of the verb. So if there's an S here, there's no S here. My friends love. 
But in this sentence, I'm going to change this to just my friend. My one friend loves the new swimming pool. Well, maybe I want to give you more information about which friend. Now, if I only have one friend that likes swimming, then maybe I could say, my friend who likes swimming loves the new swimming pool. If you know that I only have one friend who likes swimming, then you would know exactly who I'm talking about. So then this group of words becomes very important and it helps tell you exactly, it helps tell you exactly which friend I'm talking about. So now who likes swimming becomes a group of words that has a subject and a verb and it's answering the question, which friend? It's telling me which friend loves the new swimming pool. Now we have learned that an adjective is a word that gives us more information about a noun. It answers the question, what kind, how many, or which one? This group of words is answering the question, which friend, which one of my friends? So this group of words is acting like an adjective, giving us more information about my friend. That's the subject of the sentence. A friend is a person, it's a noun. This group of words is answering a question about which one, which friend. So this group of words is a clause and it's acting like an adjective, giving us more information about this noun, friend, my friend. We know this is a clause because it's a group of words and it has a subject and a verb. Sometimes it's easiest to find the verb. Here's the verb, likes. Now before the verb, we need to have a subject. So who likes? Well, actually, it's kind of funny because who likes is the word who. So in this clause, the word who is being the subject for the word likes. So subject, verb. Who likes swimming? Okay, now, I wanna talk for just a minute about this S here in the word likes. The reason we have an S here is the same reason we have an S here. If we just, when we decide if we want an S here or not, it depends on how many people the subject is. Is the subject one or more than one? If it's one, then we have an S here at the end of the verb. So all we know about the subject that goes with this word is it's who, but who is who? Well, who, we have to look here at what subject it's telling us about. What noun is it talking about? It's talking about one friend. So here we know that who is one friend. So one person, we put an S here. But watch for just a minute. If I move this back to here, my friends love, then we would also need to have, we, we would need to get rid of this S here. So if this is friends, which is more than one, then we do not want the S at the end of the verb. And this who likes, this who is more than one. So who likes swimming? This who is friends, more than one. So here, no S. So our sentence would be, my friends who like swimming love the new swimming pool. But again, I'm talking about one specific friend. So let me go back. Okay, so my friend who likes swimming loves the new swimming pool. This phrase, I'm gonna group that together. All right, so this phrase really helps us understand which friend I'm talking about. Okay, so my friend who likes swimming loves the new swimming pool. In this sentence, the independent clause is my friend loves the new swimming pool. So again, subject, verb, loves what? The new swimming pool. 
So my independent clause is actually my friend loves the new swimming pool. Okay, that's the independent clause. And that means that when we're looking at this verb and we are deciding if we need an S here or not, we need to make sure that we're not looking at the word right before it, which is swimming. We're finding out what is the subject or who is the subject that goes with this. So we might need to say, oh, here's the word who. So that's gonna be part of a clause. Get rid of that whole clause for a minute. And that will help us say, oh, it's my friend who loves the new swimming pool. My friend is one person, so we put an S at the end of loves. And this is the independent clause. If we want to add a relative clause that gives more information about who this is or which friend I'm talking about, that is gonna go right after the noun. So it will go in between the subject and the verb of the sentence in this case, because it's going right after this noun. So the noun is the subject, the verb usually comes next, but if I want to give more information about which one I'm talking about, that clause will go right here. You just need to be careful that if there is a clause here, the last word of that clause is now coming before the verb, but it's not the swimming that loves the new swimming pool. So you have to ask yourself some questions. So if you see the clause, who, this one here, let me get rid of this. If you see this and you're looking for, hmm, do I put an S at the end of the verb or not? Find that clause that's in between the subject and the verb and cover it up for a minute so that you're not getting confused. And then say, oh, who loves the new swimming pool? Oh, my friend, my friend loves the new swimming pool. This is one person, so I put an S here. When I talk about whether or not we should put an S at the end of the verb, I am talking about something called subject verb agreement. I want to pause here for just a moment and say something a little bit more about this. Every sentence in English needs to have two parts. We need to have a subject, I use red for that, and a predicate, and I use green for that these two parts. Now you can see here in when I say subject verb, I'm not saying subject predicate. That's because the most important word of the predicate is the verb. It's usually the first word of the predicate. To make a sentence in English, we have to have a subject, we have to have a verb. Other words in the sentence will answer questions like which one? How many, what kind, when, where, why, how. But the two words we have to have are subject and predicate or the verb. So in this sentence, the students need to see Mr. Brown. The subject tells us who the sentence is about, the students. And then the first word of the predicate will usually be the verb. So we look at that. That's this word need. And we have to decide whether or not we want to have it be need, N-E-E-D, or do we want to have it be N-E-E-D with an S on the end. And we make that decision by looking at the subject. And specifically, we are looking at whether or not the subject is one student or more than one student. We can look at that S at the end of the word, and that helps us know more than one student. If it's more than one student, then at the end of the word need, we are not going to put an S. But if this was only one student, then we would put an S at the end of the word needs. So a little trick to remember is that if there is an S here, then we have no S at the end of the verb. If there is no S at the end of the subject, then we will have an S at the end of the verb. So when we are writing the verb in our sentence, it's really important 
that we look and find the subject that goes with that verb and ask ourselves: is that subject just one person, place, or thing, or is it more than one person, place, or thing? Where it can get tricky is if the verb is not coming right after the subject. Well, normally it does. Why wouldn't it? It will, it will not come right after the subject if we have decided to give more information about this subject that we need to give right after it. And so we would stick that extra information that helps us better understand who this subject is. We would put that extra information right in here in between the subject and the verb. For example, let's say, let me get rid of this. Let's say that we are talking about the students who play violin. Okay, this was our example from earlier. The students who play violin need to see Mr. Brown. Well, when we look at this sentence, we find here's our verb and we need to decide, do we want an S at the end? Do we want that to say needs? Or do we want it to say need with no S? Well, we have to find the subject and find out. If the subject is just one person, student, then we would have an S here. But if the subject is more than one, then we would not have an S. So we find the verb now. If you look at the word right before it, it's the word violin. And you might think, oh, violin is just one. I better quick add an S to my verb. But this would be wrong because it's not the violin that needs to see Mr. Brown. It's the students. So this is a very tricky sentence because we find the verb, we look at the word right before it, but that word is not the subject. It's not what needs to see Mr. Brown. In fact, this word is just part of a clause that we're sticking in between the subject and the predicate to give us more information about which students. The students is still the subject of the sentence and it's what we need to match with this verb, need. So it's the students, because this has an S at the end, we do not want to have this S right here. Also in this sentence, we can look here at this clause, who play violin. Well, play is a verb. How do we know if we want to have play with no S or play with an S, plays? Do we want it to say who plays violin or who play violin? For this, we need to figure out who is the who. Is the who referring to one person or is the who referring to more than one person? One way, if our who here is the subject of this clause, one way we can figure out if this is one person or more than one person is we can go find the word it's talking about, that it's referring to. And we can just take that word and move it right over and replace the who, and then pretend that's the subject of the clause. The students play violin. So here, the students are more than one. So we do not want an S at the end of play. So it would be the students more than one play no S. So now we have our subject, the students. The verb that goes with this is need. There's an S here, so no S here. The violin doesn't matter. The violin is not doing anything. The violin is not playing. The violin is not needing. We don't have to worry about if the violin is one or more than one. We need to find our subjects. So there's two verbs in the sentence, play and need. Need is the verb of the independent clause. That's this red and this green part. So the subject that goes with need 
is students. Okay, so don't look at violin. Find who it is that needs to see Mr. Brown. There's an S here, so no S here. When we look at play, the subject is who, but who is who? Who is the pronoun for this noun? It's referring to this noun, students, more than one. So this is more than one. And you can just move students in to take the place of that pronoun and say, oh, the students play. More than one student, play. So that's how you would do this subject verb agreement when you're using a relative clause. So that is our example of when we're using a relative clause that we're putting in between the subject and predicate of the sentence. The other example I want to give you, the kids love the new pool. Here is our subject, the kids. That's the subject of the sentence. The predicate is love the new pool. The verb is love. So we look at this and we have to decide, do we want to have an S at the end of love? Well, there's an S at the end of kids, more than one kid. So no S here, okay? If it was one kid, if it was one kid, then we would say loves. And we would put this S because this is just one. But here we have more than one kid, so we have no S here. The kids love the new pool. Well, we might want to know more about the kids. Which kids are we talking about? In this lesson, we've been talking about how to use the relative clause to give us more information about which kids. But in a previous lesson, we learned about how we could also use a prepositional phrase to give us more information about which kids. And that would go, same as a relative clause, it would go right after the noun that it's talking about and right, so right in between, in this case, it's right in between the subject of the sentence and the predicate of the sentence. So these are the kids at school love the new pool. So you could say, who loves the new pool? And you could say, well, it's the kids at school that love the new pool. And that's true. But you still have to figure out what's the one word that I need to match to that verb. How do I know if I want love or if I want loves? Well, if you look at the noun right before the word, you could say, oh, it's just one school. I better say loves with an S. And that's true if your sentence was the school loves the new pool, that would work. But this sentence is not the school loves the new pool. It's the kids at school. Maybe the teachers don't like it. The sentence is about the kids at school. At school in this sentence is a prepositional phrase. The subject here is the kids. So this is a prepositional phrase that is giving us more information about the kids. But if we move this right over here in front of the verb, then we can see that kids is more than one. So because of the S at the end of kids, we do not want to have an S at the end of love. Kids love. So even though there is this noun, which is a place, it's a noun right in front of the verb, not the school that loves the pool, it's the kids. This is a prepositional phrase. If you find a prepositional phrase after the subject or after this noun, if you notice a prepositional phrase right in front of the verb, and you can see, you can find that preposition. If you find a preposition, look for a noun after it, and that will be a phrase or a group of words that you can just take right out of the sentence for a minute, and that will help you find the subject to match with the verb. So prepositional phrases that get stuck in the sentence right in the middle of the subject and the verb, they can be tricky because you can accidentally look at this now and think, oh, that's just one. I better add an S here. And that would not be correct because it's not the school that loves the new pool. School is part of this prepositional phrase. School is called the object of the preposition. 
It's not the subject of the sentence. It's just giving us more information about the subject of the sentence. But this here, the kids, is the subject. So we can make sure that we put that right in front of the verb. And then we'll say S, no S. Okay, and so this one was an example of how to use a prepositional phrase in between the subject and the verb. And this one was an example of how to use a relative clause in between the subject and the verb. But whether you use a relative clause or a prepositional phrase, both of which can be used to tell us more information about the subject, tell us which ones are we talking about. Those words in this clause and in this phrase should not tell us whether to put an S at the end of the verb or not. So we have to um, not be tricked and to really look for that subject that we're matching up with the verb. 